Hi, my name is Matt Inwood. Like I said, um, do work for a couple companies, primarily, depending on who you ask, I do in data science, data engineering, or data analytics. So I do a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I've done for both companies now is a lot of ETL. And what I want to point out is Airflow is really simple. It's something that we all end up doing probably once in a while. And I think a lot of people get intimidated with looking at things like Airflow, because this is from the Airbnb blog that introduced Airflow. And this is really complicated setup. They've obfuscated a lot of stuff. But as you can see, dependencies all over, lots of different things going on. Um, that's not always the case. This, this is a job I have in production right now. It, it's a straight line. No, nothing too complicated, really easy. So to go over installation, uh, this is just something helpful. We usually run it on EC2 instances, VM, something like that, uh, just to kind of keep it away from other production systems. Uh, once you have Py Python installed, just pip install Airflow, and you're basically ready to go. Um, all this stuff is going to be on GitHub. I'll post it to the meetup. Can you make it a bit bigger? I can. All right, this is the couple other steps you need to do to get it running. So it does operate on a database. Uh, default setting is going to be SQLite database. I'll go into more about that a little bit later. And you just need to run the two main components of it, which are the web server and the scheduler. If you want to set up any kind of password authentication, there's uh, ability to do that as well for the web server. Uh, I've never had to deal with it because we usually have other security settings preventing us from accessing that page to begin with. So these are all, I'm not going to go through everything, but it's pretty simple. You set up password, usernames, that kind of thing. The main structure of Airflow is you're going to have three main parts. The DAG, which is the entirety of a job that you're scheduling. Tasks, which are individual things you want to have it do. And just Python code. Uh, everyone here knows how to Python code. So really simple there, too. And this is the basic structure that we have. Kind of a little out of, out of order that you want to think about it, but you'll instantiate the DAG, give it a name. Default arguments is going to be passed from the DAG to any task that's assigned to it. Uh, scheduling, they have at commands, so you can set it hourly, daily. Typically, I set it up uh, with a cron expression. It uh, gives me a lot of flexibility about what time of day things are being scheduled. And if you've ever worked with Linux, or even if you haven't, there's a lot of great tools out there to just give you a cron expression without actually knowing anything about it. Uh, just a couple other settings if you want to set them. Uh, timeout is important to make sure it's set when you have bigger jobs, because it will report that it's failed on you, if, even if it's completed successfully. So if you have a job that takes an hour to run, don't set the timeout to be five minutes. Every day you're going to get a message that says it failed, and you're going to be wondering what went wrong. Uh, that's never happened to me, I swear. Uh, same thing with uh, SLAs. You can set an SLA if you want to track that. We've never had too much of an issue with that um, in the systems that I run. So then we get to the task. Uh, it's kind of obnoxious. You have to name it twice, because you're going to name it as a Python function. Then you're also going to name a task ID. I've seen people set those differently. I don't personally know why they do that. I think it's just as fine to just name it the same thing for convenience sake so you always know what you're looking for. Uh, but this is where you start to get some of the interesting functions. So one of the interesting flags you can set is provide context. And that gives you a whole bunch of embedded data from that task that can be passed onto the function. The most important one is going to be a timestamp and a date stamp. So if you're running an ETL and you're not just having it do kind of a blanket operation, you know, take a table, dump a table, if you want to set it to run specific daily data or, time or hourly data, you can pass through that timestamp. The one caveat with Airflow is that timestamp is always run, is always passed one run before the scheduled time. So what that means practically is if it's running daily and it's running on Monday, it's going to pass a date stamp for Sunday. It tricks a lot of people up. My boss. Still doesn't understand why anybody would want to do that, but that is the way it is. 
Um, same with hourly, if you have it running Monday at 6 a.m., it's gonna pass Monday 5 a.m. as a timestamp. So when you're coding anything and you're passing through that as a variable, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Other things that get passed through are task name, DAG name. Those are really important when you use on failure and on success. So that's gonna pass a Python function that basically runs when it, that task fails or succeeds. And that's really important when we start talking about any kind of notifications that you wanna set up, or if you have a certain set of tasks that you wanna run specifically if something fails. So if you wanna have something go in, delete a couple temp tables, do something on failure, that's where you would also pass into the on failure. Uh, other two really important things is it won't run without them. The Python function that you want it to run, which you'll include in the DAG file, and then just assign it to the DAG. All our DAGs are in separate files, so with, I've never written anything other than DAG equals DAG. It's really easy to remember. And just to kind of show you the example of how we use the keyword arguments that get passed. So you can just pass keyword, the KW args to on success on failure. For some reason it doesn't work if you don't use, if you use the asterisks here. I'm not enough of an expert on Python to really understand how those double asterisks works, I'm sure probably most of you do. Um, but that's really useful. So the way we use that is we send Slack messages to ourselves on failure and success. So you can see here, this is what we're running in production. Uh, what's useful is, you know, we can see how things are run. We get notified on our phone, get nice little, you know, wake up at three in the morning, go fix your ETL kind of things. So anybody who wants to be on call, get into data engineering and you're, you're on call, always. <laughs> um, one best practice I talk about a little bit later, you can kind of see here, uh, you can see these filter entry missing, just kind of weird things we write about what our code is doing. That's actually part of a forecast model that we run through Airflow. And one thing that the passing contacts, passing the keyword arguments doesn't pass through is any error messages that go through on a failure. So if you're looking for anything more than just, you know, like we have up there, failure on cloud import. It's really, really meaningful, we have no idea what's going on. Uh, with our forecast model, we've identified a lot of things that can go wrong with it and that we somewhat expect to go on, go wrong. These, these three that you see here, they go wrong every single day. We expect that to happen for about two more months and then reality and things that are happening in the real world will catch up and they'll start running. So, it's also just helpful, helpful to know everything's still running in general. <laughs> so what we do with that is we just make sure that we have exception handling in the files and that kicks back its own error message and then sends a failure to Airflow for it to track. And where are we? There. So uh, you can see here again, Python functions. The bottom ones here are what you're actually calling. So in Slack message example, this is passing through what task instance is being shared, what the date stamp is. Uh, if you scroll back up in my workbook, this is a link to all the different uh, task variables that you'll get passed through. Um, it's recommended to keep the ETL scripts separate. So you're gonna just wanna import your other function wherever you have it. Uh, we typically just keep it on the same VM, just import it over, and then we can just call any arbitrary Python script that we want. Everything you're gonna need to set up an ECL flow is these two, I said that wrong. The second one should say set downstream, but the only two commands you're ever gonna really, really need to do if you don't wanna get too complicated is set upstream or set downstream. Depending on how you pass those through, they're gonna be functionally identical. Set, setting task B upstream to task A is the same as setting task A downstream to task B. It's gonna work the same way and that's how you can get anywhere. Th this is gonna be all just a whole bunch of setting those one, line by line. Uh, in practice, the most complicated one we've done here, there we go. This is the most complicated one I'm running in production right now. Once again, you know, the thing I wanna just stress over and over is Airflow isn't complicated, it's simple. Um, everything passes through. There's a couple of points where they all have to complete before they continue. Other places, they can run in parallel. 
There is a little bit more complicated tasks, a um, whole bunch of different things. I think the only other one I've ever worked with is this branching. So you can set a task as kind of a waypoint. It'll call a function that returns the name of the next task to run, essentially. And so you can see we'll set, we'll call that function. It's going to return what, what to do based on some kind of parameters that you want to run. The way we implemented it was we had it run a different set of, excuse me, a different set of instructions on Sunday rather than the rest of the week. So if timestamp, you know, return the day of the week, go this way. If any other day of the week, go the other way. Uh, you can use that as a pass through. You can also set up dummy operators. And so that's really when you're designing your workflows, you just kind of really need to have everything hit a certain point, but you don't want it to do anything. You can just set up a dummy operator, keep it as a placeholder. That'll help manage the flow for you. So these are also in here. I don't work with these. I've had issues with them uh, with previous versions of Airflow. I don't know if they fixed that since the newer versions, but this is another way you can manage failures. You can have things set to run, whether or not everything before it has worked, whether only a couple of things have worked, whether nothing's worked, anything like that. Um, default is all success. I've left it as that. I just use other error handling that Python allows for custom exceptions, things like that. So when you first set it up, it's going to be set up, when, as I mentioned before, the SQLite database. The problem with that is any logging that it does to that database doesn't allow for concurrency. So none of your tasks are going to be able to run in parallel ever. So one of the first things you're going to want to do once you get something up and running, once you get kind of a work example for it, working example going, is to set up a different database to log to. We use a Postgres database dedicated to this. Um, that, that's been my personal choice, just so we don't mess with anything near production. Uh, but you can set it to a production database, test database, whatever you want to do, wherever you feel comfortable leaving all these log tables. So when you, when you start up that database, it's going to create all the tables that it needs, and it'll start writing to them, and it'll track all this for you. Once you do that, you can start using the local executor rather than the sequential executor. And that basically will just create a new process for every task that it's trying to run. So for example, we run about 32 cores on our VM. So when we're running some more complicated models, it can hit all those cores as it needs to and run in parallel. Whereas if we we're still stuck on SQLite, that job would take about a day and a half to run every day, which clearly is going to start causing problems. Um, haven't worked with them. It does also have capability to work with Celery or Dask if you're going to start working with distributed systems. But like I said, you know, this is to get you simple, get you started. Uh, not really necessary until you start scaling out a bit further. Uh, once again, just kind of mentioning the logging. They do also have local logs written to the machine that's running Airflow. You can also set that up if you want to dump all those text logs to S3. Those text logs will start to get pretty big depending on what you're outputting to the council as you run. So any, that also is going to be where you find any error messages when your jobs go. You can access those from the web server. So I don't know if this is going to, how well my internet's working right now. Did my internet turn off? So hopefully that'll come up in a minute. Um, but you can go through, you can read your logs and see what went wrong. If there's any kind of output, my boss likes to print a lot of things consoles when he writes these jobs. So you can go through, see different progress that's made, that's printed to the console. That'll all be there for you. Uh, this is just a note, like I told you guys before about the timestamps. We don't pass the keywords. Um, you should try to run web server and scheduler in the background. So if, if you're running on any kind of remote server, any kind of VMs, as soon as you close that connection, whatever's running is going to die. If you're familiar with Linux and systems like that, I'm sure it's nothing new. I, when I started using Airflow, I was brand new to Linux. So that's something I learned at least. Um, it does operate as a daemon, whatever that means. <laughs> um, it doesn't always work. So what I've, what I've started doing is I just make sure to run it in a screen or I run it on startup. Or one of the other issues that we run into Air with Airflow is there's no restarting. It doesn't ever pick back up if it kills itself, which it'll do periodically. Um, 
I don't know if it's something with our VM, what it is, but if it dies and there's nothing there to pick it up, it's just gonna sit there all weekend and then your boss yells at you on Monday morning. Once again, it's never happened to me. I don't know who that happens to. So, <laughs> so our solution for that is we, did, we fell back on cron, we set up a cron job, runs a Python script, searches through the process IDs, looks to make sure we have something called scheduler running, something called web server running. If not, runs the bash script, gets it running again. Uh, so we've never had downtime for more than five minutes now, which has been good. Another thing, if you're brave, um, there are other operators besides Python operator as well. You can set up hooks and connections to all sorts of different services. You can set up connections to SQL databases and, write, and run SQL directly. You can set up S3 and email servers and all sorts of things like that. Uh, we're pretty basic where we're at. We would do all of that through Python. If we need to write something to an S3 bucket, we import, we import Bodo, we write to S3. If we need to send an email, we just trigger that with whatever we use for email and Python. Same with Slack, there's a Slack operator, we just import a Slack API and we use that. If you're brave, you can do that. I, I prefer to just keep everything in Python for what it's worth. And just kind of in the end before, I just kind of walk through what's on the web server. Biggest things that we got out of switching to Airflow were how easy it was to set up, how robust the web interface has been, how we can track everything in it, and because it gives us the flexibility to use anything that we can do in Python, we've been able to do anything in Python. We've, you know, we do everything from regular ETL to data science tasks, modeling, forecasting, all sorts of things that we need to run on a schedule get run. Uh, actually got desperate and set up PDF reports that were created using matplotlib and then exported to PDF and emailed through Airflow. We can do anything. Probably shouldn't do anything, but you can. The cons are, you know, we're still running on a low, or earlier version. I don't know how many of these bugs have been fixed, but we have run into a few bugs. Um, I'm trying to see. So you can see an example here. This task, uh, city311 data, has been running for a couple weeks now. I can't click through, I can't see logs, I can't see how it's been performing. I know it's running, I'm getting success messages in my Slack. I'm seeing the data come through. Airflow is not picking it up. I still can't figure out why. <laughs> uh, if anybody who does know Airflow better than I do, feel free to let me know what I might be missing. Um, so there are a few bugs like that. Um, this is the one I do for a consulting group, the one I use for my primary job. It doesn't show last run for any of our DAGs. Uh, we made some update to our system and now that's just gone. So there's a handful of bugs in there, nothing, nothing's broken, nothing, you know, it's nothing that we can't work around, but it is a little frustrating. And just like I said before, there's nothing that manages starting up or rebooting on its own. You have to set that up in cron or you have to go in and manually do all of that yourself. So if this is working now, this is a job, this is one we actually have running every two minutes. Um, is importing some live traffic data in Kansas City. Um, so this can be marginally useful depending on what you're doing when you're setting up a DAG. Uh, we just like it's vi how visual it is and how you can just tell where your job is at any given point in time. If it refreshes, it's probably running right now. It's um, that's not good. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it's a little slow. So it's queuing up the job right now. It's got, all of this is color coded. You'll be able to see where failure points are, uh, whether a job's in retry, anything like that. Want to look at the history. Uh, you can see how the jobs have been run, running over time. This job is, a, that's actually impressive. This, uh, this particular job, because it's hitting an API every two minutes, tends to fail periodically. Uh, that's kind of an accepted risk that we've worked with. So usually I see a whole bunch of red when we hit rate limits and we, we've had a good run today. So I, get, I can't show you the failures. Um, this is another one of those tracking things that we love to look at. So we can see how long different tasks are running. I mentioned earlier that we run a VM with 32 cores. Uh, we just thought it was really neat when we switched from 16 to 32 to speed it up a little bit. You got to just watch it just drop down immediately just to see the improvement. Same here, this is just how many times it's taken to run. So if you are running into errors and it's going into retries, you can see if it's taking a few goes and you can look to diagnose how to improve your processes. Landing times is basically just the cumulative duration of all the tasks. 
And then just another way to look at how long all the different tasks are taking. Uh, sometimes the jobs get pretty disparate, so you can kind of know where you want to improve your code and kind of speed things up. And then the details just gives you some of the other information. And you really want somebody who's accessing the web server who doesn't know how to write code to go and judge your code, they can go and do that too. So that is basically all I have. If anybody has any questions. You mentioned in your blogging, uh, you can hook it up to a database and then it's uh, loaded into an S3 bucket. Is there use of stuff like uh, running it into like a Hadoop or a Kafka queue or anything like that? Is that possible? I'm sure it's possible if you can do it in Python. Uh, there's no, right now the only hooks that are really available in terms of distribu distribution is the Dask and uh, Celery. Okay. There's a lot of questions. We'll go. Do you know the level language implementation? Java or Go or Dask? I, I, I believe the entire thing is in Python, unless somebody would tell me otherwise. Wow. Who else? Oh, is it better than Luigi? Um, I don't remember why I hated Luigi, but I did. And when I used Airflow, I fell in love with it. Um, I wish I could remember what exactly the big difference was for me, but uh, when we made the switch, the only thing I missed was the amusing 8-bit uh, emojis that we were able to use in our Slack channels. <laughs> I am not familiar with Dask. I can't answer that question. <laughs> yeah, go. Uh, Airflow started with Airbnb. Can you write code like that? Is that based to uh, software somewhere? Like you, um, is that where you write the code, or, um, or do you, like, how do you version it? Uh, we just version on GitHub. So we write it locally, uh, commit it to Git, and then we import it into the VM that runs our Airflow. Mm -hmm. I was getting that tables and doing some processing downstream. Does it look for like if the table is present or not? Like, you know, okay, if I actually could code it in uh, Python, simple, with the sub process actually. I did it something with we would do inside. Like, could it do that? Like, look for something existing in that schema or not? But it was a bunch of tables being, co being created, and then I was using those. Yeah, in that case, you'd want to set a task that explicitly ran that. So you'd have it run a function that checked for that, and if it doesn't find it, throw a, f you could either set that up as a branch operator if you wanted to do something else in the case that it can't find it. Uh, they do have also sensor operators, uh, and those I don't have a lot of experience with, but those are intended to kind of check for any kind of trigger to run a job. So. I would recommend looking in, into the documentation on the sensor operators in that case. Uh, I would kind of answer the question about Dask, why you don't, sure. wouldn't use it in place of Dask. Dask is meant for jobs where you have massive parallelism. And Airflow is meant for a batch situation where you're going to have one job run to completion and the next job run to completion. When they say it works with Dask, they mean you can kick off a Dask job, let it finish, however that's defined, and well, then move on to the next piece. Well, Airflow will run anything in parallel that isn't defined as having a downstream or upstream dependency. So yeah, but it's based on tasks that finish. When you set that dependency, yes. So when we look back at this one, you know, you'll see we have this right current and right frame. Those don't have any dependencies, and those will run in parallel just fine. The, and they'll run in with all the other jobs. 
they're all, they're all meeting at this right staging, so none of these other jobs will run until everything else has yeah. hit that right staging field. So the ask is if you want 50 right currents running simultaneously. Right, which you may want to integrate with this, right? You may want to, you know, like I said, our, our forecast model runs 50, 60 tasks concurrently, but we're limited by cores to 32, so. Oh, Once again, that's I don't know too much about how the Dask and the the uh, other distributed system operators work, so I I really can't answer that unfortunately. Um, does Airflow offer uh, out of the box search? For example, if I wanted to see a particular resource uh, and how it was manipulated, uh, does that come out of the box? What kind of type? Like, what are you looking for exactly? Uh, like, I don't think I've ever seen that. So I don't believe there's any sort of searching of what's being run um, unless something in here. I haven't. Yeah, I don't really know that that's a thing. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a pretty lightweight framework for setting the dependencies and scheduling things is essentially what you're getting with a whole lot of logging. Did you? Um, so what we did with, the closest thing we get to streaming is, um, where did I have that? I don't remember where I have that job anymore. So this job is close to streaming, so we just have it set to run every two minutes. That's, that's how we got to streaming. Um, I don't believe that they have anything specific in the documentation for streaming. You could, there is a flag that you can set that a DAG would require all previous instances of that DAG to complete before running next. So if you just wanted to set it up to run continuously as soon as it finishes the previous one, you could set it to some arbitrary small amount of time, set that flag that it requires all previous instances to complete, and it would just keep kicking off in perpetuity. Part of the reason we set that one to two minutes is because of rate limits. Uh, anytime it ran just a little bit too fast, we just got shut down by the company that we're pulling data from. There isn't, it's just those lines of code. There, you can um, run it dynamically. So there are examples, even in the documentation, where you, know, you can set this into a for loop, for example. So if you know like four task and this list of four tasks, each of those tasks set up stream a parent task. So you can do things like that. And so if you wanted to have something like you said, have it come out of YAML, JSON, something like that, you could just write a short script that parses that out and kicks it out into this format. Any other questions? Thank you very much.